Salvete omnes. This video is on the intricacies and sequence of the Senate phase within the Republic of Rome board game published by Valley Games in 2009. This video is a teaching guide which forms part of the Rome Wasn't Learned in a Day series. I am Decimus Aurelius Ingenarius and I will guide you through the rules on the Senate phase. This video considers all of the rules from the 1.06 Alpha Living Rules Edition, which includes all of the advanced rules. Any references to advanced rules in this presentation will be shown in blue. As part of the annual Australia Nova Romana Games, we will also consider the ageing senators and exile rules from the version 2.16 rules of the Avalon Hills Edition. These will feature in purple when referenced in this video. The scope of this video is to reinforce most of the related rules and key concepts to enable players to be effective within this most important phase of the game. We will explore all the offices that senators can be elected to, the sequence players must follow, the role of the presiding magistrate, as well as specific processes like the prosecutions, enacting of land bills and dealing with assassination attempts. Firstly, let's understand what the objectives are for the presiding magistrate and that of all senators to ensure Rome's ongoing survival. Quite simply, the Senate phase exists to allow the senators to make and vote on proposals that will affect all of Rome. Players will need to pass proposals that enact senators to various offices, assign governors to all vacant provinces, send forces to defeat wars that threaten Rome, pass legislation that ensures an ongoing positive treasury and keep the unrest level low so the people do not rise up and revolt against the Senate. The game makes many references to the highest ranking available official through the rules. We will define this term uh, in our first chapter. The highest ranking available official, or HRAO for short, often leads proceedings and actions in various phases. Each office and senator is ranked in an order of precedence. The highest rank present among the senators is the HRAO. Normally the Rome Consul will be the HRAO in most circumstances, unless of course a dictator has been appointed. A senator cannot be the HRAO if they are away from Rome, are away as a governor of a province, are a proconsul, away fighting a war, are captive, uh, have rebelled against Rome, or are in exile as a result of prosecutions. And we'll talk more about the HRAO as the presiding magistrate in the Senate phase in a little bit later in this presentation. In this next chapter, we'll explore each of the major and minor offices that senators can hold within the Republic of Rome. The first and most prominent office is that of the dictator. Now, unlike in the modern context, a dictator was a legal and legitimate political appointment in ancient Rome. The dictator is the highest ranking available official and will always be the presiding magistrate in the Senate phase if present in Rome. Upon appointment to dictator, the senator or statesman will receive a whopping seven influence added to their total. A dictator is also considered a major office, which makes them a potential subject of a major prosecution in the preceding Senate phase. A dictator can only be considered when Rome is burdened by certain war conditions. Rome has to be currently facing three or more active wars or facing at least one war with a combined land and fleet strength of at least 20. The dictator is normally an appointment by the current serving consuls, not normally an election via a Senate vote. Now, this appointment cannot be vetoed with a tribune. If the consuls can't agree on an appointment, then the presiding magistrate at the time may call for elections with a vote from the Senate, which can be vetoed. If the consuls decline altogether to appoint one, then one can be proposed via the use of a tribune at that point. The proposals made by a dictator cannot be vetoed, although they will still be voted upon normally through the standard Senate vote. And upon appointment, a dictator is also immediately able to appoint a master of horse. The master of horse accompanies the dictator into battle and adds their military rating to their own. 
a dictator also receives a prior consul marker at the end of their tenure, making them eligible for censor. The Rome consul is normally the highest ranking available official in the absence of a dictator, and it is considered the lead or head consul. They are the second ranked HRAO and awarded five influence upon obtaining office. It is the Rome consul that will, more often than not, give the State of the Republic address in the preceding population phase. Therefore, it can be beneficial for the Rome consul to have a high popularity rating. The Rome consul is always elected as a pair with the field consul candidate. And although the Senate may discuss which senator would become Rome consul and which may become field consul, the final determination is made between the consuls themselves. If they can't decide, then they will dice off for the privilege. All senators in Rome are eligible candidates for consul, provided they are not a current serving consul or dictator. This can change in a later part of the game if a certain law card is enacted. Of course, one of the perks of Rome consul is being the presiding magistrate for the Senate, again assuming there is no dictator. The Rome consul also receives a prior consul marker, making them eligible for censor. The field consul is the secondary consul and next in line after that of the Rome consul. They are the third ranked HRAO and are also awarded five influence upon obtaining office. Now, like the Rome consul, it is a major office, making them eligible for major prosecutions. The field consul is always elected as a pair with the Rome consul candidate. And although the Senate may discuss which senator will become which consul, the final determination is made between the consuls themselves. And again, if they can't decide, then they will dice off for the privilege. All senators in Rome are eligible candidates for field consul, provided they are not a current serving consul or dictator. And of course, this can change in the latter part of the game if certain law cards are enacted. It is considered a perk of the field consul uh, to be the first of the consuls to be sent to war uh, from the Senate session. The field consul also receives a prior consul marker, making them eligible for censor. The censor is one of the most uh, experienced officers in the Roman Senate and usually required many years of service in ancient times. The censor is the fourth ranked HRAO and gains five influence. The censor is a major office and, perhaps ironically, makes it eligible for prosecution. To be eligible for censor, a senator must possess a prior consul marker. It is also permissible for the current serving censor to be elected again. The job of a newly elected censor is about managing prosecutions, and once elected, they actually become the presiding magistrate temporarily while they identify the accused senators and facilitate trials. The Master of Horse is an honorary position that exists only when there is a dictator. The Master of Horse is the fifth ranked HRAO and gains three influence on their appointment. The Master of Horse is also a major office, making them open to prosecutions by the censor. The Master of Horse is a direct appointment by the dictator, not an election, and they cannot hold any other office except that of censor. The Master of Horse has no discernible perks to, uh, to speak of. They only exist to add their military rating to the dictator in battle. They get no influence or popularity rewards from any battle victory and are still susceptible to death chit draws. The Pontifus Maximus is a powerful religious post in the times of ancient Rome. It is the sixth ranked HRAO, and although the Pontifus Maximus gets five influence upon obtaining office, they will lose this office if stripped of that uh, through any occurrence of evil omens or through a Senate vote. Sure enough, like the others, it is also a major office and subject to potential prosecutions. The Pontifus Maximus is elected into position for life, unless, again, they are found guilty of a prosecution, encounter evil omens, or are simply stripped via a Senate vote. A candidate for this office can't already be holding any other major office except that of censor. Pontifus Maximus has many abilities, including the ability to confer priesthoods on any senator in Rome, and this could occur at any time during the Senate phase, and we'll talk more on priests in just a moment. A Pontifus Maximus gets to double his personal votes, 
on any proposal that send forces against a war or recalls or retains their commander. In addition to that, this office gets one free veto per turn to use in the Senate phase, without the use of a Tribune card. Finally, the Pontifus Maximus gets an additional 1d6 talents on top of their normal income in the revenue phase. In ancient times, governors were appointed to provinces to represent the interests of the Senate in those regions. Once appointed by the Senate, governors leave Rome immediately and are considered away from Rome, and will govern their provinces for three turns before returning home. To be candidate for governor, a senator must not hold a major office. A governor is suggested by a proposal and then voted on by the Senate. Governorships are a lucrative post and senators can take provincial spoils. Any debts that are accrued during this step don't even need to be paid by the governor, but are passed on to the state treasury. Taking provincial spoils will also give the governor a corruption marker, which they retain until after their first prosecution uh, phase back in Rome. Governors can also raise provincial forces from local taxes, supplemented with their own personal revenue, and command these defensive forces against a tax on their province. If achieving victory in these provincial battles, a governor can obtain influence and popularity just like a normal commander. They can even obtain influence when successfully developing a province. A priest is a minor religious post and gains one influence upon being appointed. Priests are assigned and withdrawn at will by the Pontifus Maximus. Similar to the Pontifus Maximus, priests get one additional vote on proposals that will send forces against a war or a call or retain their commander. Next on the list is the proconsul. The proconsul is a major office that is still in command of a military force after the conclusion of a combat phase. Now this can occur when a commander survives as a non-victorious battle commander. Or they simply achieve a victory in a sea battle but do not then pursue a land battle in the same round. Like the Rome and field consul, a proconsul is entitled to a prior consul marker at the conclusion of their tenure. The next two minor officers only feature during prosecutions in the Senate phase, the first of which is the prosecutor. Now this is a voluntary position that is appointed by the censor after a senator in Rome has been identified as the accused. Convince the Senate of the guilt of the accused and the prosecutor is awarded any prior consul marker and half, fractions rounded up, of any influence lost by the accused. The other side of the prosecution bench sees the role of the advocate. This is also a voluntary position that is sought by the accused to help them defend them in a trial. If the accused can't find an advocate, then the accused is considered to represent themselves. The censor must allow the accused sufficient time to identify an advocate. The censor accepts any volunteers to this post. An advocate, who is not the accused themselves, will gain three influence if the accused is found not guilty. Now that we have explored the major and minor officers of the Republic of Rome, we will now cover the general sequence of events that occurs during the Senate phase. The Senate sequence is made up of compulsory and optional steps that are facilitated by a position known as the presiding magistrate, a position we'll talk about more in the next chapter. The Senate session always starts with the election of a new pair of consuls for the year. Then, in the absence of a Pontifus Maximus, one is elected by the Senate at this time. The first optional step in the Senate is the appointment of the dictator, only if the prerequisite conditions are met. Now, whether a dictator is appointed or not, the election for censor must then be held by the presiding magistrate. Once the censor is elected, the censor takes over as presiding magistrate briefly to hold prosecutions at their discretion. With prosecutions done, the censor hands back the reins of presiding magistrate back to the HRAO, who then holds elections for governorships. Now, after this initial sequence of events, the presiding magistrate can make any optional proposals they desire in any order, including the assignment of concessions, land bills, 
proposals to raise or disband legions, fleets and provincial garrisons, the assignment of commanders to forces, as well as considerations to recall exiled statesmen. Now, there are other unique events which may also occur at any time during the Senate phase, and regardless of the sequence step. And now these include the institution of law cards, assassination attempts, the assignment of priests by the Pontifus Maximus, and senators recalling disbanded veterans. And, of course, consul for life elections. Now, because of this last list of events, and that can occur at any time in the Senate phase, and because of its role-played nature, there are carefully defined boundaries which stipulate the beginning and the end of the phase. The Senate phase starts with the role of the State of the Republic address by the HRAO in the previous population phase. It continues until the presiding magistrate declares a Senate adjourned. In the previous chapter, we talked a lot about the presiding magistrate, but what is the presiding magistrate? The presiding magistrate is a position all senators should strive for as it commands control over the whole Senate phase. The presiding magistrate is always the highest ranking available official. If the presiding magistrate dies or otherwise loses his post, then the next highest ranking available official takes over proceedings. As stated, the presiding magistrate runs and facilitates the Senate phase. Now, they are the only ones who can make and suggest proposals. Once a proposal is defined and understood, the presiding magistrate can call for faction votes at any time. They can also call for votes from any faction they wish in any order, it's provided all factions get a chance to vote. Then, once it's decided the conclusion, the presiding magistrate can call an end to the Senate phase by uttering the phase, Senate adjourned. A presiding magistrate can lose their position if they suffer a unanimous defeat on a proposal that they put forward. Now, they can choose to step down as a presiding magistrate, or they can maintain the role if they take a loss of one influence. The main role of the presiding magistrate is to form and announce various proposals during the Senate phase. There is a set of compulsory proposals that the presiding magistrate must ensure occurs during the Senate sequence as discussed earlier, and these are the election of consuls, Pontifus Maximus, censor, and any vacant governorships. Now, after these proposals, the presiding magistrate is welcome to adjourn the Senate, but it is suggested they consider some optional proposals for the success of Rome. These optional proposals include the assignment of concessions, land bills, sending forces to war, recalling exiled statesmen, and of course the Consul for Life elections. Now to truly add to the realism and role play, it is highly welcome for the presiding magistrate to consider minor motions such as votes of gratitude, standards of dress, uh, minor office appointments, and even changes to the game layout. In the next few chapters, we will consider specific events and sequences within the Senate phase, and we'll start with a closer look at the prosecution step. When the censor is elected during the Senate phase, the censor then immediately takes over as presiding magistrate for the consideration of prosecutions. The censor chooses from the senators in Rome, who are designated as corrupt, which ones will face prosecution. The censor has four choices in the number of prosecutions that they can run. They can choose to run one or two minor prosecutions, one major prosecution, or choose to simply conduct no prosecutions at all. A senator is eligible for a minor prosecution if the corrupt portion of their concessions are revealed or they are a returned governor who took provincial spoils during their term. A senator with a major corruption marker is eligible for both a major or a minor prosecution. These four options are in addition to any special major prosecutions that may arise during the Senate phase, and we'll talk more about these later. Now, for any one prosecution the Senate censor chooses, the censor must positively identify an accused senator, a willing prosecutor, and which can be from any faction, including their own, just not the censor themselves. They will also need to allow the accused senator time to lobby for an advocate to represent them. The advocate can come from any faction, it just can't be the censor or the prosecutor. Now, if no advocate comes forward to represent the accused, the accused is considered to be his own advocate and representing himself. After any remarks, 
the censor commences the prosecution by calling for votes from factions in any order they choose. When it comes time for the faction of the accused to vote, the accused senator may opt to use popular appeal, uh, an interesting process. The player rolls 2d6, modifies it by the senator's popularity, and compares it to the popular appeal table. The results are added or subtracted to the total number of votes. Now note, there is a probability of the accused being freed by this optional choice. Or, conversely, they could be found guilty and executed by the people themselves. On a major prosecution, whether popular appeal was taken or not, and if the senator is a statesman, then they can come to the optional choice to self-exile before they vote. A statesman in exile loses all income, except that presently on their personal treasury, which is frozen until recalled. They may not receive or give money from their personal treasury. Uh, now, they may retain any knights and legion allegiance markers pending their recall, but they may not vote nor receive income while in exile. They lose all prior consul markers, concessions, priesthoods, positive popularity and influence, except that printed on their card, and any corresponding family card of the statesman in exile is treated as if the statesman had died. If the accused senator does not exile, and all factions have voted, then the final step is the trial votes. After the votes are announced, the advocate rolls 2d6, adding the advocate's oratory while subtracting the prosecutor's oratory. This modified die roll is cross-referenced with the trial appeal table to determine how many extra votes are added or subtracted on behalf of the accused. The final verdict is a sum of the popular appeal votes, the accused influence, the senator's votes, and the trial votes. If the final result is zero or greater, then the accused is freed. Now, before we discuss more on the results of prosecutions, let's quickly recap the use of tribune cards. Now, tribunes can't be used to propose a prosecution. A prosecution is not a proposal and is merely a direction of the censor only. Tribunes can, of course, be used to cast a veto against a prosecution. Now, should a player wish to veto a prosecution, they should play the card before or on their faction's turn to vote. The accused themselves can cast a tribune to veto even after seeing the results of a popular appeal. Once the final verdict is calculated, the censor determines and announces the outcome for all to hear. If the number of votes is zero or greater, the prosecution has failed and the accused is freed. That senator may not be prosecuted again this turn for the same reason. The advocate, if it wasn't the accused himself, gains three influence. The prosecutor loses three influence. A successful minor prosecution occurs when the final number of votes is a negative number, or simply a greater number in favour of a guilty verdict. The accused loses 5 popularity, which can go negative, 5 influence to a minimum of 0, they lose all concessions, which are placed in the forum, and they lose any prior consul marker they possess. The advocate, assuming it wasn't the accused himself, loses 3 influence. The prosecutor gets half of all the influence lost of the, by the accused, normally this will be about three, plus any prior consul marker lost by the accused. Now, in a major prosecution, a successful result means execution and death of the accused senator. The prosecutor will gain any uh, influence as a reward, uh, and in this case here, a senator is considered to lose all their influence upon death, so the prosecutor will gain half of all influence lost rounded up, which will likely be more. In the next two chapters, we're going to consider some optional proposals and events that can be considered in the Senate phase. First off the bat are land bills, which can often be the answer to rising unrest levels. Land bills, when successfully enacted, improve or decrease the unrest level of the Roman citizenry. The Senate can pass one land bill of each type per turn. For a land bill proposal, the presiding magistrate, or a player with a tribune, must identify a willing sponsor and co-sponsor, and these can come from any combination from any faction. Now, there are three types of land bills. A Type 1 land bill requires a once-off payment of 20 talents from the state treasury and reduces the unrest level by one in the turn it is enacted. A land bill is paid for in the next revenue phase. 
A Type 2 land bill requires an ongoing payment of five talents a year and reduces the unrest level by two only in the year it is enacted. A Type 3 land bill it requires an ongoing payment of 10 talents a year and reduces the unrest level by three only in the year it is enacted. Now, the passing and voting on land bills has some interesting effects. For a Type 1 and 2 land bill, the sponsor will gain two popularity and the co-sponsor one. Uh, and interestingly, every senator that votes against a land bill proposal loses one influence, each to a minimum of zero. The populace loves a resolution of a land bill, so senators are not looked upon favourably when voting against it. For Type 3 land bills, the popularity rewards are doubled with the sponsor gaining four popularity and the co-sponsor gaining two popularity. Any senator that votes against a Type 3 land bill loses two influence each, to a minimum of zero. Land bills can be costly, particularly when the Republic falls on hard times, but there is a solution if the Senate can no longer afford them. The Senate can choose to repeal a Type 2 or a Type 3 land bill, even on the same turn as it is enacted. There are, of course, consequences for the repeal of a land bill. Repealing a Type 2 land bill will cost the volunteering sponsor and co-sponsor popularity. That's two pop and one pop, respectively. Any senator voting for the repeal of a Type 2 land bill will also lose one influence. Now, once successfully enacted, the Senate doesn't have to pay for the land bill any further and the unrest level will increase by two on the turn it is repealed. Repealing a Type 3 land bill will cost the volunteering sponsor and co-sponsor minus 4 popularity and minus 2 popularity respectively. Any senator voting for the repeal of a Type 3 land bill will lose 2 influence each. And like a Type 2 repeal, the unrest level will increase, but this time by 3 levels. Now, often desperate times call for desperate measures. And all else failing, a player may consider using one of their senators to make an assassination attempt on a rival target. Now, once a turn, a player may make an attempt to assassinate an opposing senator. Assassination attempts can only occur during the Senate phase. Other factions cannot interfere with an assassination attempts once it is announced by a player. <clears throat> a faction that has been targeted already in a particular turn can't be targeted again until the next turn. Now, it may sound obvious, but a player cannot target one of their own senators. Finally, an assassination is initiated with a particular phrase, agreed to by all players at the commencement of the game. Something like, Die Swine! An assassination is carried out by the player making the assassination by rolling a 1d6 and comparing it to the assassination table. As desired, both the factions involved may play any relevant faction cards that modify the result of an assassination attempt. So what happens when an assassination is successful? So if the target was the presiding magistrate, the highest ranking available official in Rome, then the presiding magistrate role is handed down to the next highest ranking available official in line to continue the Senate session and any current vote. Now, if the target was a nominee for a particular office, then that current proposal is cancelled. If it was a prosecutor during the prosecution, then that cancels the current prosecution. And if it was the censor while they presided over prosecutions, then their death cancels all undetermined prosecutions and hands the presiding magistrate back to the HRAO for the rest of the Senate phase. But if the result is the assassin being caught, then the outcome is quite different. Simply, a court assassin is killed. But in addition to this, the assassin's faction leader, if not the assassin themselves, immediately loses five influence. The assassin's faction leader is also subject to a special major prosecution, where they must make a popular appeal, held right there and then, led by the censor. And if that wasn't punishment enough on a guilty verdict, each other senator in the Assassin's Faction must survive a mortality chit draw equal to any positive popularity of the target. There is a unique circumstance and perhaps an opportunity for would-be assassins during land bills. This circumstance occurs when the sponsor and co-sponsor of a land bill are from the same faction. It is worth noting that, regardless of the assassination outcome, the proposal of a land bill will still continue. 
the assassination attempt is carried out as normal, except that there is no additional punishments for the faction of a court assassin. The assassin, of course, is still killed. To finish up this video, I thought it'd be worth touching on some common errors and omissions. Firstly, there is no such thing as abstaining to vote on land bills. Senators and factions must vote yes or no, for or against. Any determination to abstain is considered a vote against a land bill. Now, when a land bill is passed, the Senate is not required to pay for the land bill until the next revenue phase when the Senate pays its debts. Now, players will often miss the opportunity to appoint a dictator during some Senate phases. Players should strongly consider leveraging a dictator for the added military value a dictator and his master of horse can bring against a war. A dictator can be appointed when there is three or more active wars or when there is at least one war with a combined land and fleet strength of 20 or more. At the end of prosecutions, all players should not forget to clear all corruption markers from their senators. Immediately after the censor concludes proceedings, everyone gets a fresh slate. Corrupt governors are the only ones who don't lose their corruption until after they have returned to Rome and have been present for a set of prosecutions. Now, we certainly encourage presiding magistrates and all players to consider minor motions. These are best described as role-playing proposals and they really add to the ambience and vibe of a game. Players should be careful, however, that they don't affect or alter the game rules in any way or hinder players from offices or certain actions. Finally, players must ensure that any optional or minor proposals they present do not force senators or factions to pay money or commit any action with or without their consent. Proposals cannot be used in this way. Now, these sort of considerations are best done with a public uh, binding deal, assuming all parties agree. Now, a good example is if all players uh, are entering into a public agreement where all factions should then contribute to the state treasury on a particular turn. Now, if all players agree, then all players are required to do this at the designated time. Now, if, for example, one player disagrees with this deal, then all the other players who did agree will carry out this public deal as they agree to. It just means that one player who disagreed is not obliged to do anything. So let's summarise what we've learned. Firstly, we learn how to identify the highest ranking available official, and this is likely to be the Rome console in most cases when there is not a dictator. We then step through nearly all of the major and minor offices that senators can hold and be elected into. Each provides different powers, perks and responsibilities depending on the office. Importantly, we step through the whole Senate sequence and identified both mandatory and optional considerations. The sequence we learn is usually managed by the presiding magistrate, who is normally the HRAO present in Rome. Keeping our senators in check, we considered the important role of the censor and the types of prosecutions they could run and how they affect accused senators. We took a deep dive into an optional set of proposals called land bills. In exchange for talents, the Senate can reduce the unrest level. We also considered a more extreme tool in the arsenal of all factions, and that is assassinations. Great for removing an opponent if successful, but they can have huge punishments and implications should an assassin be caught. And to round out discussions, we looked at a small list of common errors and omissions that may present themselves in the Senate phase. This concludes the presentation on the Senate phase of the Republic of Rome board game by Valley Games. We considered all the advanced rules from the 1.06 Alpha Living Rule set with some optional rules from version 2.16 of the Avalon Hills edition. This has been part of the Rome Wasn't Learned in a Day series presented by myself, Decimus Aurelius Ingenarius. Now, if you have feedback or comments, please send them to us at osnovaroma at outlook.com. That's A-U-S-T, Novaroma at outlook.com. And until next time... Walete. Well,